so let me say first, uh, thank you very much, Professor Li, for introducing me. And I want to thank uh, Professor Guangxing as well for organizing this wonderful conference and also our sponsor, uh, Donglin uh, Zhui Yuan. And uh, this is a great opportunity for me to join you uh, because I do want to share some of my thoughts on Buddhist canon and uh, as my topic suggest, uh, how to open the canon. I think that's the question we all care about. Actually, I think by organizing this great conference, actually uh, this conference already shown how we can open the canon. So each presenters uh, yesterday and today, uh, before me, Professor Park and Professor Walter already uh, spoke eloquently about the different aspects, different uh, issues in the Buddhist canon, and uh, that's their way of opening the canon. So I think today I'm going to share uh, some of my thought. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, but however, I have a uh, written uh, paper. So I want to read my paper, but if you look at the chat, I just send out a short uh, outline of my talk. So I'm going to largely follow these six aspects, right? So I'm gonna read my paper here. Please uh, follow me uh, here. Uh, the title of my talk is Opening the Canon, New Challenges to Buddhist Studies in Humanities Education. The meaning of a canon can be very broad and each canon is different. It can refer to a set of a classics which has been commonly regarded as foundational in the tradition. In the Christian world, if you mention the word canon, usually it means the Bible, which is a one book canon. In the literary world, it also means a acknowledged set of literary classics, such as Shakespeare's works. In East Asia, canon can be loosely translated as jing dian or classics, such as Confucian classics. In the Buddhist world, we use the word canon to refer to da zang jing, or the great store of scriptures. The canon is a loaded term in both the East and the West. Although there are a lot of similarities between canons in the East and the West, the Buddhist canon is more complicated in terms of its size, structure, and the canon making process. The number of classics is much more than the biblical canon and its structure and organizing principles have evolved through ages and remain open for creative adaptions. Under the purview of postmodern critical theory, the canon, including the Buddhist canon, represents an oppressive and authoritative force, exerting its symbolic influence on all aspects of human life. However, such a view neglects the fact that the canon is also evolving and responding to changes. The Buddhist canon in particular has been part of the communities since its, be its beginning. In contrast to the Western canon, it's always open to new additions and interpretations. In the digital age, the Buddhist canon has been more widely distributed as both an academic subject for studies and a tool of self-cultivation in humanities education. The digital Buddhist canon is a great advancement in modern times. However, it doesn't mean that we can interact with the canon more effectively and intimately. It created the illusion that we have processed the canon through a simple search of its full text, which cannot guarantee that we have understood the canon. By using the verb open metaphorically and symbolically, here I'm referring to the title of my talk, Open the Canon. I mean that it's time to fully engage and understand the history, structure, and the content of the canon. It also means that the canon is always open to us for further engagement, such as reading, commentating, anthologizing, including changing itself to allow it to evolve in this new age. The ways of opening the canon do not limit to reading and chanting the scriptures re religiously and ritualistically. Uh, it can be a collective effort of textual practice 
to make the canon central to our life. In this sense, this opening up is not an individual act, but a communal and a precipitary. Yet, because of its complexity, the canon is far from opening. There is an urgent need for us to open the canon, to familiarize ourselves with its content history, and to experience its transformation in real life. This talk attempts to open the Buddhist canon from the perspective of humanity's education and explore its humanistic value in a post-pandemic global society. The subject of the Chinese Buddhist canon in East Asia context is a familiar but challenging subject. It is familiar because Buddhist scholars have been dealing with the canon on the daily basis in order to make sure, uh, make use of its vast textual uh, repository. It is challenging because the canon and its various edition constitute a formidable text body with intricate links among themselves and a far reaching impacts on Buddhist communities. Moreover, every text and every edition of the canon has its own life involving a great number of individuals who devoted themselves to the creation and maintenance of a canon. In front of this great textual tradition, scholars should remain humble and reverent However, in the study of East Asian Buddhism, a scholarly arrogance over the canon has been developed. Dr. Louis Lancaster remarks about this in his preface written for our uh, volume, edited volume, Spreading Buddha's Word in China. So this is an edited volume I uh, co-edited with uh, Dr. Lucille Jia, and uh, Dr. Louis Lancaster wrote this preface uh, for, for the book. And I quoted uh, one paragraph from his preface. Uh, by the way, this book is published in 2016. Uh, some of my uh, thoughts here, uh, presented here, actually coming from that book as well. So here I'm quoting Dr. Louis Lancaster's uh, preface. For a few years at the end of the last century, there developed what some have called the hermeneutics of suspicion. This was particularly applied to canons that were suspected of being hopelessly exclusive. In many ways, this so-called postmodern attitude hardened over time, and the ironic result was loss of flexibility in scholarship. During that time, a response to one of my papers, so this is Dr. Louis Lancaster's paper, on the Korean version of the canon was the statement Quote, we don't use the word canon anymore. It is not current with our ideas, end quote. This signaled a sanction against even talking about what were considered to be elitist, elitist text. And it's unfortunate expanded into a derisive rejection of the very idea of studying them, end quote. So that's Dr. Uh, Louis Lancaster's uh, paragraph coming from the pref preface. Uh, this hermeneutics of suspicion is certainly developed from a simplistic understanding of the East Asian canonical tradition and resulted from a cheap complacency of postmodern speculation. In the following, let me try to open the canon from six aspects or issues which are often overlooked in canon studies. Right? So here I'm going to follow the six uh, uh, points I just sent through chat. Right? The number one, the first one is the definition of the Chinese Buddhist canon. So far, there's no commonly accepted definition of the Chinese Buddhist canon. Even the very term of Chinese Buddhist canon is misleading because although the canon is based on classical Chinese language and originated from China, other parts of East Asia, such as Korea and Japan, also engaged and contrib contributed significantly to this canonical tradition. Some scholars, such, such as Robert Boswell, prefer to use the term such as East Asian Buddhist canons, which is much broader in its connotation and extension. Some may object the use of canon as a singular with a, a definite article 
as Paul Harrison claims, quote, there is no such thing as the Buddhist canon, end quote. The singular form of a canon may conceal the fact that there are different editions and textual families within its tradition. The use of the English word canon can also be problematic, and the Indic term tribitaka has often been used in lieu of the word canon. However, as Louis Lancaster shows convincingly, the term tribitaka is not suitable to describe the Chinese Buddhist canon either, because, quote, the housing and the subsequent, subsequent listing of the texts in the Buddhist libraries of China could not be limited to the three categories of the Sanskrit classifications, end quote. And the Chinese Buddhist canon is a complex, uh, complex mixture of Indian and East Asian patterns. More questions can be raised about the nature of the canon, whether the can Chinese canon is simply a library, archive, or mere collection of a series of selected texts if compared with the Western canonical traditions. To review the structure and the physical characteristics of this canonical tradition, primarily based on texts written in literary Chinese, Professor Feng Guangchang has made an attempt to offer a succinct definition as follows to describe the Chinese canon. So here I'm translating uh, Professor Feng Guangchang, a, a retired professor from Shanghai Normal, Normal University. So he is a leading expert in the field of Chinese Buddhist canon. So here I'm uh, uh, reading this translation of his definition of the Chinese Buddhist canon, including essentially the translated Buddhist scriptures of past ages as the core of its content. The Chinese Buddhist canon is the collection of the Chinese Buddhist classics and the related literature organized according to certain structures and with some external identification markers. In this definition, Professor Fong uh, emphasizes three essential uh, elements in the composition of a canon, namely the selection criteria, uh, systematic structure, and the physical markers. In light of this definition, the Chinese canon is not an arbitrary collection of Buddhist texts, but a conscious re reassembly of a group of writings according to a well-crafted selection criteria articulated in the sophisticated compilation of catalogs, which provide systematic structures that all editions abide by. Uh, in this sense, J.Z. Smith, so I'm quoting, this is a uh, professor from uh, University of Chicago. So his definition of the canon as an arbitrary list of the text might not apply to the Chinese canon. Moreover, the canon is a distinctive physical existence with a unique set of external characteristics which can be identified as belonging to a specific variant of a text family. These external characteristics include page layout because it's a printed uh, manuscript uh, kind of a format. So there must have a page layout, calligraphic, style, binding methods, uh, printing format, and the use of a call number systems. Right? So these are all the uh, physical markers uh, Professor Feng Guangchang uh, uh, already studied. In this research, Professor Feng Guangchang uh, has consciously used this definition to uh, study various editions of the canon, especially the manuscript edition. Of course, his definition merits more consideration and it needs to be further refined. For example, uh, although Professor Fong did notice the religious aspect of the canon, his definition did not offer a satisfactory uh, explanation regarding the source of its canonicity and authority, not to mention the dynamic interaction between the canon and the religious community. So here is the first point I want to raise, uh, kind of the uh, opening up this question about the definition of uh, Chinese Buddhist canon. So is number two is the myth about a open canon. The flexibility and the lack of a rigid organization, uh, organizing standards uh, in the Buddhist can canonical tradition have been observed by many scholars. 
Paul Harrison, for example, uh, so this is a professor uh, from uh, Stanford University, believes that all Buddhist canons are basically open canons, uh, code in which commonly accepted principles of authenticity take the place of a rigidly defined and bounded set of texts in a given linguistic form, end quote. The Chinese canon is a notorious example of such open canons. Paul Swanson, for example, summarizes this widely believed idea as follows. Here is the quotation from uh, Dr. Paul Swanson's uh, uh, definition. The Mahayana Buddhist canon, so he is a Japanese uh, Buddhism uh, specialist. So here, the Mahayana Buddhist canon, uh, including both Chinese and Japanese traditions. So the Mahayana Buddhist traditions is relatively open canon compared to the relatively closed canon of Christianity or Islam, or even of Theravada Buddhism. It does not have a clear beginning or end. It is not bound by any historical period or geographical area. It is possible to continue to add to the Mahayana Buddhist canon. Scripture, or more accurately, the word of the Buddha is not limited to actual words of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. So end quote. Professor Swanson's description gives people a wrong impression that the Chinese Buddhist canon never encounters the issue of a closure in its long history. One of the historical reasons for such openness, as Dr. Uh, Louis Lancaster points out, is the piecemeal transmission of Buddhist texts into China, which requires Chinese Buddhists to keep their collections open in order to search for the missing texts. It is true that for modern canons, which value their academic merit as collections of the essential texts, the structure of the canon tends to open to changes. However, a close look at the canon formation process in East Asia reveals that after the initial opening phase uh, of, the, uh, of a few centuries, the Chinese canon appears to have reached to a point of closure in the mid eighth century with a serious attempt to create a standardized register of canonical texts or Ru Zhang Lu. Eventually the Chinese canon did base itself on a core body of texts stipulated by monk Zhisheng's Kaiyuan catalog. This is uh, Zhisheng's Kaiyuan Shi Jiao Lu which fixed the size of the entire canon at 5,048 fascicles, uh, and 480 cases. For centuries, despite the fact that the size of the canon continues to grow, this core body remains stable without much alteration. In the popular consciousness, the canon closed with this number of texts listed in Zhisheng's catalog. The number of fascicles in Zhisheng's catalog was even mythologized in the Chinese folklore and became the standard size of the canon in popular Chinese novel, Journey to the West. Uh, this is referring to Xi Yu Ji. Uh, if you have read uh, chapter uh, 98, for example, uh, there's an entire list of uh, Buddhist canon incorporated into uh, Xi Yu Ji as well. So in this chapter, uh, I mean, Journey to the West, the Chinese canon was described as having exactly 5,048 fascicles. In reality, texts from Zhisheng's Kaiyuan catalog forms the core of the main canon and it became a sine qua for all uh, canons in pre-modern East Asia. The issue of the canon uh, being open or closed raises an interesting question about the role of catalog in shaping the structure of the canon. Studies of Western canons show that the canon is basically an extension or transformation of a list, as Jay-Z Smith, for example, tends to reduce the canon to a mere list or catalog of uh, in enumerative nature, which has, uh, quote, no necessary beginning or end, and a no necessary articulated principles of order, end quote. 
the list or catalog was transformed into a canon only because the element of closure was added. added. Therefore, the notion of a canon implies the idea of a closure. For the theologian Paul Ricoeur, uh, he used to be a, a professor at the University of Chicago as well. The canon has to be closed because the closure is, quote, a fundamental structural act that delimits the space for the interplay of forms of uh, uh, dis discourse and determines the finite configuration within which each form and each pair of forms unfolds its signifying function. These reflections on the nature of the canon as a closed list calls for our close attention to the role which catalog plays played in the formation of the Chinese canon. Moreover, the case of the Chinese Tribitica catalogs is more complicated because a register of canonical texts, Ru uh, Zhanglu, was placed within the much uh, comprehensive catalog, which is both descriptive and uh, enumerative. Excuse me. The nature of the Chinese canon is a open or closed system still awaits for further exploration on its historical evolution and the structural changes. It is perhaps better to describe the Chinese canonical tradition as a dynamic interplay of openness and closure to avoid simplistic characterizations. So this is the second point uh, I wanna make. So the third one is about what I call the cult of the canon. The creation of a canon is a work of a face that involves a series of devotional activities in the creation, distribution, and the maintenance of the canon. And it can be referred to as the cult of the canon. This religious phenomenon has been deeply rooted in the Mahayana tradition of the cult of the book as defined by uh, Gregory Chopin. Right? So if you can uh, read, have read Professor uh, Chopin's work, uh, of course, this concept called of canon uh, is derived from his concept called of the book. Right? So he notes that the early Mahayana scriptures played great emphasis on worshiping written texts. In China, the cult of the book had been a long-standing cultural tradition that preceded the advent of Buddhism in China. And the reverence and even uh, fetish, fetishization of works such as the Buddhist and the Taoist canons were natural developments. The Buddhist canon presents the ultimate teaching of Buddhism and the essence of the Dharma body and is therefore the potent sy symbolic capital in Buddhist communities serving as a means to connect with the origin of the tradition and to the ultimate scriptural authority. The state, elite groups, and the common people have all aspired to sponsor the production and distribution of the entire set through devotional patronage and sponsorship, ceremonial consecration and uh, worshiping, ritual writing and reading, etc. Ownership of a canon would greatly enhance the prestige of a monastery, stimulating the growth and the revival of religious devotions and attracting more patronage. In the process of its creation, the state invested a particular significance in the canon, as it was believed that the ownership of a canon could protect the nation. The Korean king, uh, for example, had requested Kaibao Canon, so Kaibao Zang, from the Song government for the security of the nation, and the later created their own canon as a way to defend themselves against the Mongol invasion. Right? So here I'm talking about the Goryeo edition. So there are two uh, prints in Korea. And the commoners could also sponsor the project out of their devotion. The creation of a Zhao Cheng canon. So this is Zhao Cheng uh, uh, canon uh, created in the uh, Jurchen or the Jin Dynasty, for example, was initiated by a little known Buddhist figure called Yin Shi uh, and continued by his best known female disciple, Cui Fa Zhen, who uh, severed 
her arm at 13 and a vow to print a, uh, a Buddhist canon. Previously, by the way, I just want to uh, note here, uh, we only know Shui Fa Zhen was involved in the uh, creation of the Zhao Cheng canon until recently we discovered Stili and it says clearly this has started uh, with his teacher called Yin Shi. So this project was supported by lay people in Xiezhou, that's today's Yuncheng area in Shanxi and neighboring areas. More than 50 followers uh, imitated her devotion. So this is Trey Fa uh, severing her arm, right? As, and they also uh, severed their arms as well. So they collected funds by burning arms and fingers and cutting eyes and livers and even donating all family properties and selling their children. It took them about 30 years to complete the entire canon. Uh, Cui Fa Zheng was allowed to be ordained uh, and award, awarded a purple robe and a honorific title. Uh, so this canon uh, later became uh, the so-called Hongfa canon. The physical canon can be treated as a sacred object for veneration and sacrifice. Donors can adopt one title or one fascicle or even one booklet for offering during the period of one year. Such adoption is renewable. During Buddhist holidays, the hall of scripture storage, right? uh, Lo, for example, which was designated for the purpose of veneration was opened to these uh, donors for worship. The canon was also regularly brought out for, from the cabinets to prevent dampness. This practice developed into the ceremony of summoning the scripture, so-called the Shai Jing. So usually that's uh, the, the six months, the sixth day of the six months right, in, the, in the southern uh, area, in the Jiangnan area. Right? Uh, the purpose is, of course, to expose the scripture to uh, sunlight. Uh, it's also an opportunity for public display and respect. In the Buddhist tradition texts, have served a essential spiritual purpose for believers. The huge number of texts in the Buddhist canon has been used for ritual reading and writing. Ritual reading of the entire canon was developed when it is still in manuscript form, commonly known as turning the scripture, Zhuan Jing. The activity of ritual reading inspired the invention of the revolving view, view storage cabinet. So here I'm talking about Zhuan Lun Zang, so which is which was a very popular form of veneration of the Buddhist canon in the Song dynasty. Right? Uh, if you go to Hangzhou area, uh, for example, the Gao Li Si, right? the, the Korean temples, if you go there, you can see a, a very uh, gigantic uh, a cabinet, revolving cabinet is still uh, there. It was rebuilt. Right? Uh, so this is for symbolic reading of the entire canon. In the Ming Dynasty, it was often referred to as reading the whole canon in confinement, right? It's called so-called the Jin Bu Yue Zang, so which involved solitude, worship, ablution, and even fasting. The devotees vowed to read the entire canon in three or four years for the purpose of benefiting all sentient beings. Right? Uh, so please read the Buddhist canon, right? So it, you can finish it, right? If you can spare three or four years. So that's the third point I, I want to make. Uh, basically, uh, reading the canon, uh, canon we have to remember this is a religious compilation. Uh, there are venerations, worship, uh, religious aspects involved in the creation, circulation of the canon. So number four, the fourth point I want to make is about uh, Buddhist canon and technology of production. It has been long ignored that the canon has a distinctive physical dimension involving a process of production and reproduction by utilizing the tools of writing, printing, digitization in today's world. Uh, by the way, writing is also a technology, right? uh, not mentioning printing and digitization. So these are all the uh, technology for uh, people to express uh, themselves uh, uh, on paper in a di different kind of media format. As J.J. Smith, so here I'm quoting J.J. Smith a lot because he wrote an influential uh, uh, paper on canon catalogs and the classics. So here is his uh, quotation. Uh, canonization as a secondary process is inseparable from modes of production. 
it is as much a fear of technology as theology, right? So lots of people focus on theology, but actually, according to Jay-Z, Smith is also a technology. Therefore, the canon is also a sacred object code that is always manufactured and all but in infinitely reproducible. Even W.C. Smith, right? this is William Cantwell Smith, a professor uh, at Harvard University, who is not a specialist in Chinese canon, but he recognized the importance of printing technology in the production of the Chinese collection. He remarked on the Buddhist canon in his famous book, What is Scripture?, that the growth of the canon, quote, had to do with the decision of financial sponsors or of particular printers, and not only of imperial authorities or even Buddhist monks deciding what to include in the edition of the scripture, end quote. In each state, stage of the Buddhist canon, we can see clearly the use of a new technology transformed the canon as a physical object. During the manuscript era, the canon grew out of the flourishing scribal culture in medieval China, in which transcribing Buddhist texts was a social and a religious enterprise involving devotional writing of the devotees and the use of professional scribes and the tools of writing, classifying, and binding. The use of printing was a technological revolution, which initiated further changes in the layout and the binding style of the Buddhist canon, the mode of social mobilization and the reading mode of the public. Jiaxing canon, so here I'm talking about the Jiaxing Zhang, so which was uh, related to actually the Jingshan Temple in Hangzhou and also a, a Lengyan Temple in uh, Jiaxing. Right? So th these temples are very close. So the Jiaxin canon created during the 17th and 18th century, for example, adopted the commonly format, common format of a string uh, bond style and greatly facilitated its circulation and public reading. During the digital age, the canon as a collection of hypertext uh, has some features which are completely different from the print culture. So here we're in the digital age. So there are digital canons such as Sibeta, uh, SAT, SAT, uh, created in Japan, for example, became uh, become increasingly popular. Right? So we have to remember the media uh, uh, have changed. So there are some features also change as well. In the future, as Professor Feng Guangchang predicts, the text will be no longer controlled by a single author, and the readers from online communities now can participate and interact with the canon collectively as authors as well. The canon, therefore, is not fixed, unified, or even coherent. It may become forever open to all possibilities, devoid of any linear and hierarchical structures. The changes brought by technological revolutions are obvious in the history of the Chinese canon. However, it is still unclear how these technological advances changed the way people interacted with the canon and what effect these changes brought to the canon itself. More complex is the interplay between orality, writing, and a printing in the past and the digital media in the contemporary world. If the digital trend is continuing, it's very likely, especially during and after the pandemic, I believe this digital, digital trend right, will, will continue. It may suggest the process of decanonization, right? So DE, decanonization has occurred and attempt to deprive the ultimate authority of the canon, leading to the uh, dissipation of the canon as a coherent and a consistent whole. Right? So here I'm not offering a solution or a prediction, but simply a question. Right? So what, what happens if technology, if media of uh, Buddhist canon change? So, so what, 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 what's our definition concept of a canon? Right? Can, can canon still be a canon? Uh, so that's an open question. Uh, number five, it is about the canon and the community and its place in East Asian Buddhism. In the English speaking world, under the influence of scholars of religion, such as William Cantwell Smith, I just quoted, uh, the Chinese Buddhist canon has been studied under the rubric of the comparative study of sacred texts or scriptures, 
However, as Paul recall, aptly pointed out 30 years ago, such a, a anti-historical approach heavily relies on the technique of textual criticism borrowed from biblical studies. So in the, in the field of the uh, sacred texts, so this is basically developed from the, uh, the Western biblical studies. Moreover, such a approach has fundamentally isolated the canon from the community that constituted it, right? So the canon actually is a product of community. It's, right now, our tendency is to isolate the canon from the com community itself. So the recourse concern alerts us to pay more attention to the role of the canon in Buddhist communities. The formation of the Chinese Buddhist canon was deeply rooted in Buddhist community because it was a complicated religious, social, and a textual practice involving collective efforts from the national, local, and personal levels. Religiously, the creation of a canon is a work of faith that involves a series of devotional activities and it can be referred to as the cult of the canon. So I already uh, kind of uh, make this point before. Meaning a series of devotional activities involved in the creation, distribution, and maintenance of the canon. Socially, such massive production and distribution of the texts are facilitated, uh, facilitated by various social conditions in a particular time period. Each edition is a project that mobilizes local or even national resources and negotiates its relationship with the state and the local societies. Textually, the canon is a wonderful display of the skillful management of Buddhist knowledge in light of scholarly technique, techniques derived from the Chinese textual tradition. The highly sophisticated cataloging practice and the classification system demonstrated the results result of uh, original uh, bibliographical studies of Buddhist texts by Chinese Buddhist monks. Right? So in the previous talk, if you remember, uh, Dr. Albert Walter already singled out six different Buddhist strategies towards the Buddhist canon, right? So classific uh, classification of the teaching, for example, so that's a typical Chinese strategy uh, to classify, to organize the Buddhist canon. The making of a canon was in particular a social practice that involved a private and official uh, scribe to toria, uh, printing shops, and imperial and gentry patronage, monastic and governmental organizations, nonprofit or commercial distribution. In the pre-modern era, the creation and distribution of the Chinese Buddhist canon was symbolically tied to state power. On the one hand, the compilation and the printing of a canon could only be completed with government support because of the amount of resources involved in the project. On the other hand, the official support of the Buddhist canon symbolized the extension of state power into the religious realm. Through these processes, the Buddhist canon acquired a unique character that reflected various dimensions of social relationship, among which we can see a clear interplay of the symbolic power of state authority, the use of technology of production, and a social chain of creation and distribution. To clarify the relationship between the canon and the community requires scholars to be more attentive to these dynamic social relationships rather than being satisfied with superficial descriptions of the canon as a static textual existence. Only through uh, a meticulous historical study can we review the role of Buddhist canon in the history of East Asian Buddhism. It is hopeful that the re-examination of the history of the Chinese Buddhism, uh, East Asian Buddhism through the angle of the canon formation will help us create an alternative historical narrative independent from the sectarian model. Uh, let, let me come to the last one, number six, the Chinese canon in comparative perspectives. It has to be remembered that the formation of the Chinese canon is only one instance of canon formation in East Asia and the world religions. To review the nature of a canon formation and to better understand the can, Chinese canon itself, it is a great need to conduct comparative studies as Jay-Z 
Smith recommends in his following remarks. So here is once again a quotation from his paper. What do we have lacked are comparative studies. The attempt to view canons and the processes of canon formation as generic categories in the study of religion. So the study of religion is uh, typical of uh, uh, doing research according to categories. Uh, the Chinese canon has three contexts for comparison. So here I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a listing the three uh, I, I thought about. First, within East Asia, there are different processes of canon formation in different cultural areas. Both Korea and Japan, for example, formed their distinctive canonic cultures and their pattern of canon formation and experience, experiences with a foreign textual tradition. Here it is a Chinese tradition, actually, were different from those of their continental uh, counterpart, the Chinese tradition. Meanwhile, the Chinese canon has to be situated in the process of canon formation in different sectarian backgrounds, as each sectarian movement, such as Chan, Tiantai, tend to focus on their sectarian canons independent of the great canon tradition. Right? So you may recall uh, Professor Albert Walter already pointed this out uh, in the Chan or Tiantai, they have their own uh, different notion of uh, what is canon for their sectarian purposes. Second, the Chinese canon belongs to the Buddhist canonical tradition and it can be compared with Tibetan and Nepali traditions. Right? Uh, so obviously this is a Buddhist tradition. So there are lots of uh, uh, overlaps between Tibetan Bali canon and the Chinese canon. Preliminary comparative research shows that although these Buddhist canons share some common characteristics, they differ considerably in their structure and organization. Uh, Richard Solomon, for example, uh, a professor from University of Washington, expert in Gandhara Buddhism, points out that the Buddhist canons stand out by its size, diversity, and the flexibility, and they share similar techniques such as selecting, uh, abridging, and anthologizing texts. However, each tradition is different about its conception, their conception and the organization of the canon. Some more restrictive, such as the party canon, some more inclusive and encyclopedic, such as the Chinese canon tradition. Such comparative work has not yet begun and will generate exciting discoveries regarding the characteristics and the nature of the Buddhist canon in general. Finally, in the scope of world religions, the study of the Chinese Buddhist canon can be furthered by the com comparative study of sacred texts and the canon formation in world religion. Although attempts have been made in the past among uh, the comparative studies of sacred texts, much can be done based on in-depth studies of each tradition. So this is the last point I, I, I wanna make because uh, we want to further open up the canon. So then it is necessary for us to compare the Chinese canon, canonical tradition with uh, other Buddhist canonical tradition and further with uh, the, the, the world religious canonical traditions as well. So let me conclude my talk here. Right, so here I have a short uh, concluding remarks. The Buddhist canon is no longer confined to religious communities. Rather, it has become a legitimate field of research in humanities. The field of humanities today has become increasingly interdisciplinary. It provides new tools such as digital humanities and literary analysis to study complex subjects such as the Buddhist canon. In the process of reinventing the humanities, research on the Buddhist canon can play a positive role, allowing scholars to experiment different research methods. This new path of humanity, humanities research can also help to preserve the Buddhist canon as a body of cultural heritage and allow it to enter a broader network of information among scholars and tertiary institutions. Many people 
have discussed about the decline of humanities in recent decades, and the COVID pandemic seems to have worsened this declining trend. Some may suggest that the humanities may vanish or disappear. However, I think the pandemic provides a great opportunity for the humanities because this crisis has spurred us all to reflect upon the priceless value and also limitation, fragility of human life. The Buddhist canon is such a treasure house that has created a centralizing spiritual force amid this decentralizing world. By working together, humanity scholars can look at the Buddhist canon from a humanistic perspective beyond merely bibliographical and textual approaches. In this way, both Buddhists and humanity scholars have the potential to open up new opportunities for each other. This new strategy, uh, energetic synergy, may generate a new paradigm of research, teaching, and outreach for higher education. In 2014, I attended a AAR, so this is Association uh, Academy of the American Religion panel on Buddhist scriptures and the canon in San Diego. But by the way, this year, uh, I attended uh, online uh, the AAR uh, meetings. So my impression from the present papers and the panel discussion confirms my observation that the interests in canon studies and the role of the sacred scriptures are growing. However, uh, there remains suspicion and skepticism about the vet validity of the use of the very term canon as a useful category for study, which Dr. Louis Lancaster has alluded and uh, I quoted in the beginning. I would call this kind of academic arrogance because scholars' daily handling of Buddhist texts give us a false sense of erudition in front of a vastly complicated textual tradition. However, as Charlie Hellesley, a scholar of Southeast Asian Buddhism at Harvard Divinity School, who also presented a paper on uh, Bodhagosha's view on scripture, reminds us that we should remain humble when talk about scripture in the canon. So here is his quote here. So uh, uh, let, let me skip this. I think we're, we're approaching the end of uh, my talk. I have uh, used up too much time. <laughs> So uh, let, let me conclude, right? So real, this is a real conclusion. Let me conclude by looking towards the future of canon study. We should stress that the Chinese Buddhist canon is a living tradition. In East Asia, the canon remains central to Buddhist religious life, especially when the tradition is undergoing significant transmission and the Buddhists need to go back to scriptures and the canons to seek their spiritual roots and the textual authority. We anticipate that the tradition of the Chinese Buddhist canon will continue to, ev to evolve with time and serve as core of a Buddhist tradition in East Asia and beyond. Right now, there are too little Western literature on the history of the Chinese canon, and many more needs to be done to explore the formation and transformation of the tradition. This exploration of key uh, issues, uh, I just outlined in this talk, is an initial step to provide an overview of the history and the content of the canon and to invite serious discussion about the critical issues in the study of this great textual tradition. Uh, thank you very much. So this is basically uh, my talk here. Uh, sorry for, for the time. Uh, yes, so thank you. Hello, Professor Wu. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we're waiting questions from uh, members of the audience, um, I have one at my hand. Um, you have uh, presented us a very informative and educational uh, presentation on the um, macrocosm from macrocrostic pers uh, perspective about the Chinese Buddhist canon, uh, especially the rich meaning through various of a definition of the term and generally the dynamic and the complexity of uh, the Chinese canon. So it's very educational. Uh, like I say, you presented from a ma macrocosmic perspective. Uh, my question is from <laughs> microcosmic. Um, 
my question is related to uh, the formation of the canon, uh, to be precise, the making of the printed canon. So how close actually uh, did the maker of the printed canon really followed the catalog of Buddhist texts in China? I mean, um, I ask this because I observed that there are some cases in the canon, you have uh, the title of Buddhist texts written differently in manuscript survived today, but you also have the title in the printed canons. There are discrepancies, not very much. Uh, the, one of the discrepancies is what I covered yesterday in my talk uh, on the use of the term fosso. There are some texts uh, of which the title contains the phrase, but there are texts which are not uh, having this term in printed canon. So that's why I ask how actually uh, the, the, the canon maker actually followed the catalog. Do they have a kind of their own principle uh, generally based on what they um, have at hand in terms of having manuscript uh, as well as basing on, I mean, in terms of their organization, basing on the catalog of the Buddhist texts? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't attend the uh, on-site session yesterday, right? So when you uh, made the presentations, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, and the, the question you ask is a very, very important one. So basically what it is, I think, is a relationship between catalog and the canon, right? And my talk, this talk, because it's a keynote talk, so I, I think probably I, I will approach it from a general perspective. So it's not a very specialized talk on any particular canon, for example. Uh, although we talk about uh, the Buddhist canon, uh, for example, it's very generic, but however, when we talk about each individual edition, each canon is a individual case. And here you raised a very important questions, a uh, very important question, which is the, uh, uh, the relationship between the catalog and the canon. And we know in the history of Chinese Buddhist canon, there exist many, many different kind of a, a catalog. Uh, if you uh, look at the existing ca uh, catalog, that's we, we talk about Daoan, for example, in the third century, fourth century. And uh, before him, there are already catalogs according to his uh, uh, documentation. Uh, but however, the question about printing canon here, uh, if I'm correct, you may refer to the Kaibao canon, right? So which was uh, finished around 983. And uh, that one, we know for sure, it follows Zhisheng's Kaiyuan Shi Jiao Lu, right? It follows that. But if you look at the, very closely at each uh, uh, title, you, you want to find the correspondence in the Kaiyuan catalog, uh, there are variations, there are different kinds of variations. And uh, as I, I mentioned in my talk, you, you must think about the Buddhist canon as a particular existence, which means uh, physical existence, uh, because the uh, canon has to be printed, right? So the first printed canon. Then the question is where it comes the master copy. You can imagine the process is that if uh, the creators, the producers, have the catalog, they want to find a master copy to reproduce that. And then the Kaibao canon was created in Chengdu in Sichuan, right? So if we know this, this early Song dynasty, right? It's early uh, Northern Song dynasty in the Taizu's time. And the, and the Sichuan was just conquered by the Taizu. Uh, the reason that this canon wasn't printed in Hangzhou, for example, Hangzhou at that time, not yet part of the Song empire. And, and the question is where uh, those producers will find their master copy from which they can create this print, printed edition. Obviously, it got to be a manuscript edition. 
But for manuscript edition, we have to bear in mind that uh, the, the edition, the, the physical format is not stable, which means each scriber, right, each scribe, uh, the person who, who handwritten the canon will have mistakes, for example, right? So this is not accurate. So there got to be some uh, changes. Uh, uh, so each manuscript edition going to be different. So this got to preserved in the Kaibal canon, right? Uh, simultaneously, just a little bit behind Kaibal canon, we have a second printed canon, which is the Qi Dan or the uh, 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 Qi Dan Zhang, right? Printed in Beijing. So these are two different systems based on two different kinds of uh, master copies, manuscript editions. So that one, if you compare, uh, the, the, the actual printed version look very different look very different. And that is further confirmed by the Korean Goryeo canon because that one was even better collated. Uh, a Korean monk called Sugi actually uh, compared both the Kaibao canon, the Kidan canon, and the first print of the Goryeo canon, right? So, so the result is a very fascinating, very revealing, right? And the, for the uh, relationship between the canon and the catalog, I want to comment uh, just very briefly Right now, I start to question, right? Uh, what is Buddhist canon? But just, just to put it very uh, simply, in my talk, I also mentioned Jay-Z Smith, for example. The catalog is very important because it is a list, right? And with try to imagine a canon without catalog, right? Can you imagine a canon without catalog, right? So right now, it becomes a very, very interesting without catalog, canon, what we call a canon, just a collection of random books. Nobody will know the structure of the canon because the books just come together. This happens when the Japanese imported the Jiaxin canon from Zhejiang area. So in the 17th century, the Japanese merchants, they brought the canon from Jiaxin, they shipped it to Nagasaki. And in Nagasaki, the Bakufu officials registered all the books in their catalog is just completely a mess. So there's no structure, no sequence. Uh, so you, you don't know what it is, just a bunch of the Buddhist books, right? So this raises a very interesting question. Uh, without the catalog, without that list, we have, there, there's no Buddhist canon. So this is probably too radical, too radical here, right? So we can talk in more detail about each uh, different canon, their formation process. You're gonna see something very, very interesting uh, about the relationship between catalog and the actual canon, the physical canon, right, in existence. There's no identical canon, right, to, to, to put in, the, uh, in, in this way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, certainly I agree with you in, in a sense that um, there must be a kind of a catalog serving for the structure, general structure of the canon. You, you need to have some kind of organization uh, of the texts which are scattered around. Um, so my, my point is that uh, perhaps in the process of uh, making a canon, well, they have the organized structure already, but well, they were copying the title of the each manuscript or each text, they would follow the hand copied the manuscript instead following the title showing in the catalog. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's, that's a valid mm -hmm. point. Um, mm -hmm. and you, you, you answer, your answer, you mentioned that uh, Korean uh, edition was under making, they observed the huge um, varieties, variations between the editions. Now, I, I'd like to ask a related question. Um, there is a kind of a view saying that um, the edition of Kaibao Canon were based on poor hand copy manuscripts. Now, my question is, if the project was supported by central government and funded by central government, the cent central official go there to, to, to uh, supervise the project. Why didn't they get the better quality manuscripts, for instance, preserved in the palace library or somewhere, a palace monastery, etc. Why didn't they get that? 
Okay, let, let me answer in this way. Number one, you use the term poor, right? Mm-hmm. To describe. Uh, that's that's All some of... scholars um, <laughs> express this kind yeah, of yeah, view. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not yeah. certain. Right, right. For, for, for this Kaibao canon, you have to bear in mind that before the creation of this printing canon, the uh, Taizu, right? Song Taizu, Zhao Guangyin first ordered Sichuan to produce uh, a canon, manuscript canon, handwritten canon in silver and the gold, right? So, so it's not poor, right? The yeah. government has money, so it's the gold and ink, right? So the, the ink is kind of a, made with gold and silver. So they created actually manuscript copy. So that costs lots of money. And, and the, the, the poor quality you refer to probably is the textual or bibliographical, right? So the, the, the master copy. Uh, what we're talking about. But you have to remember just what, what happened in the Song Dynasty, the reason why uh, the Song court want to reproduce British canon because right before Zhao Kuangyin, that's the later Zhou Dynasty, Hou Zhou. Mm-hmm. So the Buddhist persecution just happened, right? In the North, not in the South. So you can imagine the Buddhist scriptures being destroyed. So they're, lack, they're lacking of Buddhist scriptures okay. in the Northern Area. So that's why it was kind of a, this task has been given to Sichuan, right? Because Sichuan is kind of a, the, the origin of a printing. Their printing technique is well developed. So that's the reason why this has been given to Sichuan. And, and you talk about this bibliographical problem because the Korean monk I mentioned called Sugi, the Chinese will pronounce as Shou Qi, right? This is Shou Qi, uh, two characters. Sugi, he noticed this. Uh, that shows the master copy, uh, uh, the, 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 the Sichuan carvers they use, somehow is inferior if you compare with the Kitan version. But however, the Kaibao canon also innovated, right? So in a great way uh, for creating a printed canon because they, they, maybe it's not innovation, they changed the format. The standard, if you look at the Dunhuang manuscript, the standard kind of a, a, a number of one column going to be 17 characters. But if you look at the Kaibao canon, it's much larger and bigger because one column is only 14 characters, right? So this is new. This, this is new in the manuscript tradition and only Kaibao canon somehow uh, use, use this uh, uh, format. So you can come to the conclusion that this must be a local or regional tradition. So, so I, I usually don't judge the quality of you know canons because each one is individualized and has a close connection with the community. So I emphasize community as well. So you have to look at the, the Buddhist canon traditions within that local regional community. Right? So I recently published a paper on the creation of a Kaibao canon in Chengdu, for example. Uh, so, so it's very, very likely it was produced in a Buddhist temple, right? Uh, so, so, so there, there are different organizations. There, are, there are possible government uh, participation, and but however, you you mentioned government, gov- government maybe commissioned this task. But however, uh, this is a Buddhist enterprise, so very likely the government going to assign this or outsource, right? Outsource this to a existing printing network controlled by Buddhist monks. So they get job done, the emperor's happy. So eventually they ship all the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, printing blocks right, to Kaifeng. And, and that's the process. Uh, as a first to print the canon, I think it's good enough, right? Yes. This is the first one. <laughs> yes, the yes. second one, the Korean canon, by the way, has been considered as really better correlated uh, because of the uh, advantage of seeing both Kaibao Canon, which is coming from central China, and also Kidan, uh, Qi Danzang from the north. Right? So mm-hmm. it, it's a great advantage for Koreans to be able to do that. Right? Mm-hmm. Very likely, they have access to the uh, southern uh, scriptural tradition. I mean, the Zhejiang or Hangzhou area. So I mentioned in my talk in Hangzhou, there's a temple called Korean Temple. That's because the Korean prince uh, uh, Weichang, right, is in the Song, Northern Song Dynasty, visited China and brought back uh, lots of uh, Buddhist scriptures, right? So Weichang lived between the first printing of the canon, Korean canon, and the second printing of canon. So he is right in the middle. 
So, so pretty sure the Koreans somehow got a great advantage, right? Although situated at the peripheral of the Chinese empire, but be able to see all these different canons, so they created a better one. So that result got assimilated in the Taisho canon. So the re reason that what Taisho canon is much, much more superb is because exactly because he inherited the Korean tradition. Uh, however, the tra Korean tradition never had substantial influence in China. The Chinese were, were not aware of the Korean uh, canonical traditions for a long time. 